Good morning. Okay, there we go. It's good to see you this morning. See those bright, happy, smiling faces out there? Let's sing a couple songs. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. This next song. Isn't he wonderful? It's one of my favorite songs. It has a little answer part, and then we all sing together. So follow David on the answer, okay? Isn't he, Isn't he beautiful? Beautiful. 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 Isn't he? Isn't he? Prince of peace. Son of God, isn't he? Isn't he? Isn't he? Wonderful, 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 wonderful. isn't he? Isn't he? Counselor. Almighty God, isn't he, isn't he, isn't he, isn't he, one more time, isn't he, isn't he, what beautiful, 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 isn't he, isn't he, son of God, son of God. Wonderful, isn't he? Comforter, almighty God, isn't he? Isn't he? Isn't he? Isn't he? Jesus, 
Happy Sabbath. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen? Amen. We have a reason to celebrate today for so many different reasons. Uh, first of all, we'd like to invite um, and welcome our guests this morning. Thank you for being here at Camarillo Estia Church. The doors are always open for you. When I talk about celebration, uh, there is something specific that I'd like to announce. Uh, Royal and Lady Joy Jensen. Um, are proud to announce that they have given birth to their son, newborn James Sidney Jensen. He was born yesterday at 12 noon. I'm told that he's 20 inches long, 7.25 pounds, and mom and baby are healthy. If you'd like to see them, they're at St. John's Regional Hospital. Um, secondly, Pastor, I'd like to come forward and make an announcement. We have a transfer request going out Regina Rerick and is there a motion to entertain her request so moved. been moved and is there a second all right all those in favor wave goodbye to Regina and we hope to see her back soon and we send our blessings with her on her journey today's flowers are given to celebrate the dedication of Ethaniel Serrano who will be dedicated today. And with that, Dr. Lowe, would you come forward to make an announcement? This is good. What am I supposed to be announcing? Oh, all of this stuff. <laughs> all of this stuff? Oh, yeah. This and that. Oh, no, and I don't think so. Oh, okay. <laughs> All health related. Okay, well, tomorrow, for those who didn't make the information session last Sunday, we are starting this coming Sunday night, eight week se uh, session, hourly sessions from 6 to 7 p.m. on emotional eating. It's going to be a great series, and it's going to be facilitated by uh, a bunch of our members here Ann Curry and Christine Kozlowski and uh, Lisa Dickinson, and with help from Courtney Crook. So it's going to be a great group, it's a group format. Uh, they have excellent information, so if you've ever been on a diet and failed, if you think you uh, eat when it's good, when you eat when it's bad, when you're sad, when you're mad, this is the class for you, which is about 80% of the people here. Um, so please uh, make yourself ava available to do that program. The, the cost is $40 for the eight weeks. That co covers the cost of the materials that you'll receive. So it'll be a great event, and I hope that you'll maybe know people who who could use the program, it'll be very helpful. Um, the other event that will be coming up in February, about a month from now, February 23rd, will be Healthy Taste of Ventura. And we are off to a much better start. At this time last year when we did the Healthy Taste of Ventura, we had about 30 people signed up, and we ended up having almost 200 come. Well, this year, right now, we have 114 or 15 and counting signed up, and we hope to fill this place and have this place packed by a month from now. So 
you'll be seeing uh, advertisements online and also um, in the county newspaper in regards to uh, that event. So I think that's all I've got. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. If you'd look in your church bulletins, you would see that there was an event, a Marine, jazz, a Marine Corps a jazz band that was originally scheduled for next Thursday, the 30th at Newbury Park Academy. That has been postponed, and we will let you know um, when, when it would happen again. The other thing I would like to announce is that uh, there is a very important church leadership meeting on Sabbath, February 8th. All church leaders are invited to attend. Um, it's very important. And please bring food. Don't forget that. Uh, we have an announcement from the social uh, committee, so I'd like to call Mariana up. Okay, this month is almost over. I can't believe. So February 1st is our social, which is next Saturday. And we would love to um, encourage all of you to be part of this. This is a chance for you to come and just hang out with your family and uh, have a great time, but mainly bring a uh, soup. This will be like a little cook-off and we'll have judges. We're still looking for somebody who wants to be a judge. And um, if you're not participating and you can't come but you'd like to make a soup, you can still do that too, that we can uh, enter you into um, a contest. And um, we're doing a little bit of a, like a Western team, so if you'd like to dress up more like that um, type of a outfit, it's, it will be great. Uh, looking forward to it, and um, hope you join. Thank you. Sister Tammy Mitchell has an announcement as well. Real quick, uh, put on your calendars, I don't believe it's in here yet, but there will be information coming February 22nd, Sabbath, Children's Church. Those of you that have been around a while know I used to stand up here for that. I'm actually kind of excited. We're going to do it a couple times here this spring and see how it goes. It's for ages four and above. Um, the kids will come in here first for announcements, and that's when we'll dismiss them to go on over there. Younger kids are welcome, but we ask that a parent come with them because we do have crafts and things like that. And those of you that were my staff before, if you'd like to come help, some of the same characters cast of characters will be there from before. It's going to be a good time. Look for information to come. Thanks. Thank you. Roy Bracia has an announcement. Good to see you too. A report on our uh, Typhoon uh, project that we've got going on. You see the container in the parking lot of the church. Uh, I just got a letter yesterday from the Philippines from the uh, head of the educational department on the island of Leyte, and uh, it took me two months to get this because there's still no electricity, there's uh, no phones, uh, it's very difficult to get this. I'm not quite sure how she got to me, but she did, and she left a message, and she said 90% uh, of the school facilities uh, have been damaged, and the schools are not functioning normally. Uh, she said the magnitude of the damage will take years for the schools to be restored. And unless help comes from other sources, uh, restoration and rehabilitation is impossible at this moment. Uh, we built a dam uh, dorm over there uh, in this last year, and we hired professional contractors to go out and uh, do the work on that dorm. We paid them $6 a day. So uh, the income over there is just not there to support what needs to happen. Uh, Remax Olson right now he is uh, uh, running a full page ad to try to get clothes and donations to help us. Remax Gold Coast has also joined us. Uh, Fidelity National Title has joined us. Uh, one agent, Rupin, have been going door to door uh, de delivering hundreds of the flyers to all the people. We're getting a good response in Thousand Oaks. Uh, we just, uh, Sharon with uh, uh, the Oxnard School is just now ordering a container. So we'll have a container in Oxnard, Camarillo, Newberry Park with the, new, with the school there. Thank you, Sheldon. And uh, 
than the one in Thousand Oaks. So we're going to have containers everywhere. I'm really encouraging the members here to send that flyer to all their friends and to encourage them to clean up their uh, closets and their garages and help us fill those bins. We do have the money thanks to uh, a large supporter of Prime Realty gave us several thousand dollars to send these used clothes over there to those people that have nothing. Thank you, Roy. Let's continue to pray for the people of the Philippines and all the efforts that go into that and also pray uh, for our church family. There are several um, health concerns and other concerns that are listed in your bulletin. With that, with that being said, let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you right now for bringing us here today. Thank you for your Sabbath. Thank you for your people and the wonderful people they are. We pray right now, first of all, um, for the people of the Philippines. We ask that you would continue to be with them, to comfort them. Help us to do that, all that we can to help them as well, Lord. Um, show your, uh, your Holy Spirit upon them and help things to go better. Uh, pray for this church family, Lord, and the leadership of this church as we continue um, to minister unto others, Lord. We ask that you will continue to help us to do so. Be with the children of the church as well as they grow up. Help us to continue to teach them uh, the right way and continue to bless us in all the efforts that we do um, in all the ministries that happen in this church, Lord. Bless us as well. Thank you for your worship today, and we ask that we would just uh, put everything aside and just to focus on you. Um, thank you for so many things that you have done. In your name we pray. Amen. Jesus said that his house is a house of prayer. Amen? Amen. Last week, Pastor Dennis uh, 
instituted a new part of the service. Where in the beginning of church, the congregation, God's children, start the worship service in prayer together. This week, I'd ask that we do something a little bit different. As many of you as possible, when we pray together, um, can you pair up in twos? And if it's not possible, if there's an odd number, you know, of course, make it work. Um, I understand that maybe Madison has something to share. If she's not ready, it's okay. It's all right. But this week has been filled with many good things in our church family, I know. And maybe there's more requests. But we had something to share with you. Hello, everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit down just because my blood pressure likes to drop sometimes when I stand up for too long. Um, I kind of want to come to you today. Um, and I, I probably will cry, but I feel like uh, Jesus has something I really need to share with you. You know me as probably a shy girl, and that's fine, you know. <laughs> I, I never understood what it was to uh, truly be loved, and I didn't feel like when I came in here that I deserved to truly be loved, and for you guys to just, you know, share things with me, to pray for me, to just talk to me, it always meant so much, and it was exactly what I needed every time, but um, what was hard for me to accept is that I, I thought I wasn't um, loved as you guys thought I was. I didn't understand that Jesus was the answer to my life, and um, I want to come to you as Madison, and not the girl you've sometimes heard about over the past uh, few months, and this has been extremely hard, and many of you know that, um, you know, and so I feel that I must share that Jesus has really put it on my heart and I want to tell you that I finally understand what it is to be accepted by Jesus and as an 18 year old girl you don't want to believe that you there's a possibility you may die and you may not see the rest of your life and um, I'm so nervous right now I'm sorry it's, I, I don't like talking in front of crowds but I, I feel like Jesus is just really wants me to say this to you guys and um I just want to tell you guys that I really like to be here, and um, it's because of all of you and the feeling that Jesus gives me when I'm here, and I had to realize that I may die if I didn't understand that, and even if things don't turn out the way I hope they will, it's in the understanding that there is still a fight to be fought, and I'm prepared to do that, so I want you guys to know that every time I come in here, it'll be with a clear head and that it'll be knowing that I'm connected to my dad. And um, I just want you guys to know, I really want to get you get to know you guys and I think I will really like you all. I'm messy and shy and I get uncomfortable sometimes, but <laughs> I know you guys are here because you love Jesus just as much as I do. And um, I, I just love all you guys for being here. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much for blessing us for what you shared. Some of you may know that the Adventist Media Center is headed towards a, a, a chapter, as you might call it, in its life. Um, one that is going to be closing. And there's people in our church that are our friends. Our, our family that are going to be affected by it. And we've been praying for them, and I hope that you have too. But if this is the first time you've heard it, your family needs you. Um, all the ministries, of course, need your prayers, but especially your church family here too that's going to be affected by it. Uh, in your bulletins, you see the, the requests for, for prayers of healing um, and other things. Um, so at this moment, for as many of you that can, Let's kneel together, pair up with at least one other person, three if you, know, you need to. And I'm going to start with prayer, and, I'm gonna cl and Pastor Dennis, can you close? And we're going to give you time to pray alone and with each other um, in between, all right? Let's kneel together.
Our Heavenly Father, you've said that your house is to be a house of prayer. And we want to start this year off by pursuing your words, Lord. We're your children, and we want to enter a new dynamic with you as a family. We want to experience what you mean by prayer. So, Father, I ask just now that your spirit would bless each and every one of our hearts, our minds, as we open ourselves up to you and with our brothers and sisters, Lord, in prayer. Bless this church, Lord. You've, you see what you've called us to do. We want to do that, Lord. And we ask through prayer that you inspire us and bless us to do your work. Hear your people, Lord, just now. loving Jesus. What a privilege it is to come to you as a church family, lifting up our requests to you, our praises to you, letting you know the song that's on our heart. Jesus, for those of us here today that may have a burden that needs to be lifted, we plead with you now to lift that from that individual or those individuals. Give us heaven's peace. Give us the full endowment of your spirit. The Holy Spirit in full supply in our hearts and in our lives. So that we can be the disciples you have called us to be. Cleanse us from all sin and keep us walking in a glorious relationship with you. Our eyes heavenward, our hearts open to your voice in your direction, in your guidance, in and for our lives. Keep us, Jesus, walking with you, your light upon our path. We've chosen the narrow road, and without your light shining before us, we may trip and fall. But with you with us, 24-7, we have protection and safety. We thank you and give you praise for hearing and answering our prayers this morning and for blessing us with a very special blessing. May every part of our service today and this next week be just incredible as your Holy Spirit guides us, leads us, retools us, re-equips us for a fabulous discipleship experience with you. Again, we say thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen.
love of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longing as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story more wonderful it seems than all the golden fancies of all the golden dreams. I love to tell the story it did so much for me, and that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat what seems each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best, seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. Scenes of glory I sing I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Thank you and be seated. need this table over here. If all the children would like to come up for a story, I have one to share with you. Yeah, that was good. Let me scoot this back a little bit. I have a story. Shannon, can you hold this for me, please? And I didn't get this put together here, so let me do that quickly here. How many of you can tell me what this is? That's 
a tongue. See that tongue there? And do you see those designs here on the tongue? Anybody tell me what those are? They're taste buds. We have our taste buds here. Did you know that the average person has 10,000 taste buds? And they're replaced every two weeks. And the older you get, some of them don't get replaced. So your older group of people, <laughs> there's a class of people who may have only 5,000 working taste buds. So that's why sometimes if you taste something and your grandparents might taste something or your great-grandparents might taste something, it would taste stronger to you than it would to them because your taste buds, you have more. Now, I have some things here, and let me see if I can get this organized here. I'm going to need to have a mic stand here. Now, I need, I need some volunteers. Do I have any volunteers? I need about, oh, let's say eight, okay? So, do, can anybody tell me what, t what areas of taste do we have? There's about four main areas. I'll show you here. Here in the front at the tip you have sweet. Here on the side you have sour. In the back you have bitter. And then right combining in the sour and through the sweet there is salty. Okay? So we have bitter and then there's another one they talk about you can taste mushrooms. So but these are the basic ones that we have, and I need somebody. Let's see. Which one's this one? Do I need to put them in there? Yeah. I didn't want to have this uh, mixed up and bring up water, so I'm going to mix these up here. Now. None of this is toxic. <laughs> Just will excite some of your taste buds. All right, now I need someone. Let's see. Okay, I've got hands. Let me just get this. Okay. I'm going to have. All right, let's try this one here. All right, I need, okay, let's have you and you. Now, I want you to put this on your tongue and I'm gonna have you, you can stick your tongue out, I'm going to put it all the way in the back. So let me put it all the way in the back. Now, can you tell me what that tastes like? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, okay. Well, let's see if your partner here can tell me what it tastes like. Sweet. Interesting. Now, I put it on the tip of your tongue where we taste sweet, and I put it on the back of your tongue where we taste bitter. So your taste buds are working properly. Okay, I need some other helpers. Two more volunteers. Okay, you in the pink stripe and the little boy behind you. In the red, yep, yeah, you. Okay, now, I'm gonna put, if you can stick your tongue out, and I'm gonna put it there. Now tell me what that tastes like. Um, it doesn't really taste like anything. Okay, you didn't taste anything. Okay, let's see. Let's put it there and see how that tastes. What did it taste like? A little bit spicy. Spicy? Well, it wasn't spicy. It was salty. Did it taste salty? Okay, that was salty. Would you like to try something? All right. Can you find another friend? To try, you want to pick another person to help me? Would you like to? 
Okay, you can help me. All right, you want to stick your tongue out? Now, what does that taste like? It tastes what? Yummy. Uh, it tastes yummy. Okay. <laughs> let's see if your, let's see if your um, friend here can tell me how that tastes. Sour. Sour. That she said it tasted sour, and you said it tasted l yummy. Now I need one more. Who wants to do that? Okay. Okay, you. Okay, this one might. You can come up. Okay. You want to stick your tongue out? Now tell me what that tastes like. Does it have Nothing. It doesn't taste like anything. Okay, let's see. I don't know how strong this one's going to be. You want to stick your tongue out? It's all the way in the back. Better. Bitter. That was bitter. Okay. So you see, our tongues were created with a very, very delicate balance. As you can see, there's all these taste buds, a very delicate balance. I'm going to tell you a quick story, and I hope I have time. One day, someone brought me this very huge head of cabbage. And when I saw it, I thought, what am I going to do with all this cabbage? Well, I went to the uh, cabinet and pulled out my recipe book. That's what you do when you don't know what to cook. So I went and I found, I looked through here, and no, nope, not potato salad. Oh, here's one, cabbage salad. Oh, that looks so good, I thought. And it's very simple, head of cabbage. I had that, bunch of cilantro, uh, greened onions, pine nuts, juice of a lime, salt, and olive oil. Oh, that's very simple. I had everything. So I, uh, but I didn't have pine nuts. Do you have pine nuts in your house? It's not something we generally have, and I've never cooked with pine nuts. So I had to go to the store and find some pine nuts. Have you seen pine nuts before? I'll pass this around while I tell the story, and you can look at them. Try not to squeeze them. Pine nuts come from a pine cone. Yes, a pine cone. And there's only 20 that are really big enough for us to worry about eating. In fact, if you look, there are some pine nuts in here. If you want to look, oh, yeah, here's some. And we actually took some of these pine nuts and cracked them open and ate them, and they tasted very good. So you can, pa you can pass this around, too, and look at the pine nuts. So we had some pine nuts. And since this was a huge head of cabbage, it made a huge recipe. Well, the kids and I were by ourselves. Our, my husband was away speaking. And we had this big bowl of cabbage salad to eat. And we ate it all. Half of it in one sitting, and the other half the next day. It was good. Well, a day later, we had some food, and it didn't taste too good. So that was, maybe it was just our taste buds. So the day went on, and we had some waffles and some blueberries that we just picked. And oh, we love waffles. Any of you like waffles? with peanut butter and applesauce or blueberry sauce. Oh, it's so good. But we had some applesauce on there, and the blueberries, the blueberries weren't very sweet, and the applesauce was bitter. Now, have you ever had bitter applesauce? Well, we had some bitter applesauce. And in fact, everything we ate was bitter. And the next day, the same. I called a friend of mine who worked at the hospital, and I said, is there anything going around? Is there something in the water? Have you com heard complaints of, from anybody else? Is there something affecting people's taste? Bitter. Well, she said, no, but I'll call you back. So she did some research. I think she just went on Google. That's what I should have done. She went, did some research, and she called me back, and she said, would you by any chance have eaten any pine nuts? I said, oh, yes, I found this excellent cabbage salad, and it had pine nuts in it. And I just proceeded to tell her how wonderful the salad was. She said, well, there's the culprit. Pine nuts? Well, 
I went and researched myself. Pine nuts, if you get the wrong kind of pine nuts, like I said, there's 20 species of, of pine nuts, and there are a few species of pine nuts that are not edible. And I'll tell you, they come from other parts of the country. One is from China. And we actually got the pine nuts that came from China. And they, what will happen, it's called, it's a medical um, phrase, metallogusia. It's a metallic bitter taste. Your taste buds are masked so that only bitter, all you taste is bitter. Now, how many, how long is it that you're, until your taste buds are replaced? Two weeks. This is a temporary condition, and it can last from one to four weeks. In Korea, they have a pine nut oil, and they say it's a good appetite suppressor, and I can believe that because we were hungry, and we saw strawberries and blueberries and, and something else that might look good, and you eat it, and oh, it tasted so bitter. You just didn't want to eat. The water tasted bitter. My daughter even went to the cabinet and pulled out some sugar, and the sugar tasted bitter. Everything was bitter. Well, do you know what? When God created this world, he created this world with a very delicate balance. But something came and destroyed that delicate balance. Do you know what that was? Anybody know what that was? Sin. Sin came and destroyed that delicate balance. And Jesus gave his life. He came down here to this earth to live and die because he loved us so much. When that sin entered the world, what was the result? Eternal death. But Jesus came and gave us an opportunity to have eternal life. The delicate balance will be restored. And the delicate balance can be restored in our lives every day. We can pray, create us in a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within us. Now, I have some handouts. I don't know if I have enough, so if there's brothers and sisters that want to share, or you can uh, see me, and I'll get you some more um, copies after church. But I have a little activity for you to do this afternoon. And it says, can you see my taste buds? It's going to be a little mouth that you can make. Something to do, and as you do this, I want you to remember the delicate balance that Jesus created and wants to restore in our lives each day. God bless you. Well, did you all learn something new about pine nuts? Well, I think we need a strong transition to something really sweet. How about you? Are we ready for that? Well, I'm going to invite Vladimir and Dulce and their family to come up and join me, along with Ethaniel. What an exciting day this is. It's so much fun to add new children to our church family. Can you say amen? Come on up. Got to get at you in the spotlight up here. Wow. And look at that hair. I think I was six before I had that much hair. 
But he is a handsome young man and just really special. You know, I was thinking this morning of why we picked this week to do the dedication. And if you were paying attention to the adult lesson this week, it was on children and God's plan for his children, and that's to bless them and not to harm them. I'm used to having both hands available, so this is really awkward, but we'll see if we can get through it, okay? And uh, Ethaniel, keep that smile, okay? Well, Vladimir and Dulce, we've been looking forward to this. And God has entrusted the two of you with an awesome gift. Ethaniel's name has been written on the palm of God's hand. And I can see God every once in a while just thinking, how is Ethaniel doing today? But yours is written there too. And so it's a family affair. Now he sees the three of you and he's saying, I've got to watch out. I've got to protect Ethaniel today. I've got to take care of mom and dad. You see, Ethaniel, though, has depended upon you to teach him how to respect and love God and to learn God's plan for his life. You see, God formed him first in his image and then yours. Ethaniel has not only your DNA, but God's as well. Given this tremendous responsibility, I urge you to stay closely connected to Jesus as you awaken each day. I put pray here in capital P-R-A-Y for the power of the Holy Spirit to plan your day for you and for Ethaniel so that you all walk in the protective care and power of Jesus. Teach Ethaniel to understand and obey the commandments of God. This will protect him and prepare him for the journey he has ahead. And this is God's plan for his families. He talks about it in Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, where he says, And you, mom and dad, must think constantly about these commandments, the Ten Commandments, I am giving you today. This was Moses talking to all the children of Israel. You must teach them to your children and talk about them when you are at home or out for a walk, at bedtime, and the first thing in the morning. Tie them on your finger and wear them on your forehead. And write them on the doorposts of your home. Now, Grandma and Grandpas, that's your job too. So we all have an aunts and uncles and all the family members. And a bigger family, right? So it's your job to become so close to Jesus that you are forever in his, Jesus' saving grace and power. You will need all of his power to give you the heavenly wisdom to teach and train Nathaniel to love God with all of his heart, mind, and soul. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 22, 6, Train up a child in the way that he should go, And when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is an admonition that every set of parents must remember and follow. The good news is you're never alone. When you invite Jesus into your home, with that beginning of the opening of your eyes in the morning, and you invite him there to dwell in your heart and in your lives, he's with you always. You have your family, too, to help you, as well as a village of church members that are here to support you and to pray daily for you, yes, and with them for Ethaniel's growth in spiritually, mentally, and physically. So may God richly bless you, Vladimir and Dulce, on this journey. It's going to be fun. It's going to be challenging. There's going to be days when you say, will he ever stop crying? But they will pass. And you will remember, not those days, but you'll remember all of those joy-filled days 
when he blessed you beyond your imagination. Our desire is that you pray daily for the power and grace of Jesus to be with you and to guide you and to protect Nathaniel. I'm going to ask you to hold the mic for me. And I'm going to change places with you. Dulcie, come close. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to bring Ethaniel before you this morning. You love him. You have plans for him. And those plans are for him to prosper and grow in your grace and in your love and in your power. Protect him always and forever. And just pour your spirit into him with an anointing that he will be full of joy and praise for you all the days of his life. Protect Dulcy and Vladimir. Keep them all walking safely in your grace and power is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Your turn to pray. All right, I have a certificate for you and a gift. While I'm doing that, we're going to have a beautiful song sung. sons stood before the prophet their father knew a king would soon be found when each one passed except the last no one thought to call him for surely he would never wear a crown shepherd boy God may see a king and even though your life seems filled with ordinary things in just one moment he can touch you and everything will change when others see a shepherd Sometimes it seems so hard to understand. But things like chance and circumstance, they don't really matter. Our Father holds tomorrow in His hands. Tremble! 
What a blessing that was. Thank you, Aunt Linda, for blessing us with that. Well, I have your certificate of dedication and a special memory of today. I'm told that elephants have a big memory. So may you remember this and write it on your heart. God bless you and keep on your journey. And may we help them and pray with them on that journey. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today's offering is for religious liberty. And I wonder, because I was searching my own life, uh, how many have been uh, involved with any religious liberty issue? Anybody? One person. Uh, that's... that's Oh, well, you're pastors. You don't count. Um, you almost got fired from Magic Mountain. Every week I had to come in and tell them, I'm a Seventh Avenue. And Wait, did you lose your job? After nine months, they made it a little too difficult to stay. So oh, they did. Yeah. Oh, Magic Mountain? Tactics. Oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> well... I know with the majority here, and including me, I haven't really been, that hasn't really been an issue to me. But uh, for those that there have been an issue, it really means a lot as far as having our religious liberty. Uh, we have had people fighting for us, and things have changed for the better, believe it or not, in certain things. And I wanted to read this little, uh, there's a couple of paragraphs here about our religious liberty and and uh, did you know that this year is the 50th anniversary of the uh, church state council which was set up in 1964 for um, these issues of religious liberty uh, we uh, really want to commemorate the 50th anniversary and do so with full appreciation for the legacy of violence against blacks that led to the legal protection against discrimination, including religious discrimination. In the midst of the tumult of the 1960s, 1964 was a year to remember. On the heels of Kennedy assassination, Lyndon Johnson was able to push through a Civil Ra Rights Act of 1964. Title VII of the act prohibits uh, employment discrimination and quite literally against workers because of their race, gender, and re or religion. Later bills would forbid age discrimination and require accommodation of those with disabilities. 
1964, a young Seventh-day Adventist attorney named Warren Johns established the Church State Council as the Religious Liberty Ministry of the Pacific Union Conference. For the past 50 years, the Council has been monitoring legislation and conducting a broad ministry devoted to defending religious freedom. Thanks to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Council has had a legal basis to help literally thousands of Seventh-day Adventists, as well as persons of many faiths who suffer religious discrimination in employment. The Council has also vigorously advocated for liberty of conscience and the separation of church and state in the courts and legislature and Congress. So, uh, I want you to know there are people still fighting, have been fighting for a long time for our religious rights uh, and other discriminatory actions that uh, people put upon people. So, uh, in your bulletin, you have this trust and obey pamphlet. If you get and open that up, you'll see inside it has a little envelope and a place that you tear this off right here and you can put um, your money check in there and uh, put that you would like to get the uh, Liberty magazine or like to just give a donation to send that Liberty magazine out to uh, other members in, uh, in the area and uh, in the United States. The, uh, it only costs $6 uh, subscription, so it, it really could go a long way. Anyway, uh, I have a little video that will help you also understand uh, uh, how this works as far as paying for the religious liberty. Ted, you want to show that? You can become involved right now in defending religious freedom through your religious liberty offering. First, check your church bulletin. You should find a religious liberty brochure with a freedom bond attached. Tear off the bond and fill out all the information, including your church and conference. Enclose your offering in the freedom bond envelope and place the envelope in the offering plate. Make sure you indicate whether or not you want to receive Liberty Magazine. For every $6 in offering that you give, one subscription of Liberty Magazine can be sent to a prominent thought leader. If you have friends or know of a particular leader in your community who should be receiving Liberty Magazine, please submit that name and address to your local church Religious Liberty Leader. Thank you for your generous support. Okay, will the ushers please stand for prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all the liberty you have given us that we kind of take for granted. Um, other people in other countries have um, indicated that they're praying for us because we have the liberty and we don't take it serious, whereas other countries uh, have persecution with this liberty, uh, not having this liberty. We ask you to bless us, bless our endeavors to uh, keep uh, a freedom that we enjoy so much in our country. We ask you to be with us and may our offerings swell to meet your needs. In Jesus' name, amen.
Scripture and prayer is, is found in John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one, who, no one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sabbath, and please help us to remember that you are the way, the truth, and the life. And please help everyone who, who needs like sick or who needs help with their sicknesses and illnesses. And please help our church, and please help all the schools. And thank you for everyone and everything. Amen. church family. 
That was beautiful. Amen? Have no fear. I have no plan to uh, accomplish my hour and a half diatribe on you. I will be merciful. Um, I think I can get you out of here in a decent time. But we can still see you. It's okay. What you uh, have before you is the um, the miracle of adolescent animation. <laughs> um, oh, good, it's up. Before I do anything, let me test this. Ha ha ha! Good. It even goes in reverse. It works. <laughs> All right. Um, let me just say this. Um, as a pastor, um, and, I, and I speak for Dennis, and I'm sure he absolutely agrees, it is a blessing every week to be with a congregation who believes in the Bible. Amen? Uh, it would be frustrating if every week uh, Dennis and I would get up here, and as we preach the Bible, you would have blank looks on your face. It would be quite lonely experience. But your fellowship uh, is a wonderful blessing to ministers, and thank you very much for that, family. Um, let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, I don't want to talk to people today. I don't want to inform them, and I don't even want to inspire them. Father, I ask that your word does that. I want your word to inspire us, and I want your son, Jesus Christ, to uh, grow in our hearts in the next few moments, Lord. May your word speak, and may it um, make in us what you want. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have been here in the last three or so months, I've been slowly going through a series, and this is the last one. And believe it or not, the sermon that I preached in December was... Oh, no. Ha. Ah. Was over here um, about Jesus as your servant, your servant savior. You guys remember that? Kind of? Yes? No? All right. Say amen if you remember. All right. Good, good, good. All right. Today, we are finishing. Where's the laser? There it is. We're finishing with orthodoxy. The kind of the one that I've been kind of worried about. Who wants to hear a sermon about orthodoxy? <laughs> Yay! Very good. I'm encouraged. Thank you so much. <clears throat> People don't wake up every Sabbath at our Adventists and want to hear about facts. Well, have no fear. I'm not going to talk about facts. I'm here to talk about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Good. The title of the sermon is The Difference That Jesus Makes. And I hope that that's what you hear today, all right? When I left high school, I left from an Adventist high school. I grew up in the Adventist church, and I had a choice. I could go to Adventist uh, education, or I could go where my heart chose. Well, at the time, at that age, when I was 18, I didn't have a relationship with Jesus, nor did I really want to pursue one. And my parents loved me so much that they were willing to, you know, devote their life and their treasure to support me if I wanted to make a spiritual choice for a college. I loved them so much that um, I respected them. And I said, you know, I understand what you want of me, but I would feel terrible if I felt that I wasted your money. Because I don't really have anything with God. And if I did... If I wanted to, I would want it to be genuine. So I want to be uh, a dentist. My passion is science. Not that I'm in, in evolution or anything, but there's a college really close. I mean, come on, guys. You're going to save a lot of money if you help me out. And I went to Cal State Northridge. And I went there for five years. I've got really good education in biology, microbiology, and it was all set for dental school at USC. But God did something in that experience. 
But the very first semester I was there, you can sit down, that's all right. You're going to get tired. We're not there yet. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. I took a class out of curiosity. It, it was one of the humanities, and it was a class called The Bible as Literature. Oh, no. I got the bread color. <laughs> Very good. It was a class in which um, the instructor, who happened to be a pastor, and at that time I didn't understand uh, a pastor of, of where he was at. He happened to be a Unitarian minister. And I had to ask him what that meant. But the class was taught from a new perspective that I'd never heard growing up in the church and going to Adventist high schools and elementary. It was from a perspective alien to me. And he started off the class by saying, the Bible isn't true. And he proceeded for the next three and a half months to categorically um, destroy anything of faith or miracles or anything in that nature about scripture. And he ended the class on a very odd note. He said, you know, the, the Bible has a truth to it, but as to what it is, I don't know. Now this man had two PhDs in, in Bible um, interpretation and history. I think he also was an archeologist. My memory serves me well. And he knew as much of the Bible as anybody I've ever known. And all through that semester, he had wisdom and all kinds of stuff to back him up. He had theories and theologies. But it was strange to see a man specialize in something so well, but at the end have nothing to say, other than he knew a lot about something that meant nothing. And that struck me as odd. Now, I didn't immediately pursue a life with Jesus, but that was the start of my experience in a secular world, in a secular university. And it never left me. The book that um, he first introduced us to was a book by a gentleman uh, written by uh, Marcus Borg. Have you ever heard of him? Anybody? I don't recommend the book, but if you're curious about theology and where most of Christendom is currently in the way that they look at Scripture, well, here's a starting point. It's a book about his personal experience as a Christian and when he started to reread the Bible with a different set of lenses. A set of lenses that uh, amount to different types of theology as to what the Word of God is. Now, in that class, we learned about textual criticism, historical criticism, higher criticism, biblical criticism, a lot of criticism. Nothing really positive about the Bible. And I don't expect you to see this <laughs> up here, but this is a, um, a kind of a map of the view of Scripture in a large part of Christian history. And it goes something like this. There once was a time when the church was young when they believed that the Word of God was the Word of God. They believed that it was an inspired piece of work made by a bunch of inspired men. But along came time, and time changed that. The people who knew Jesus died. And they left their disciples who didn't meet Jesus. And as time went on, their faith changed. And what that meant was their faith in the Scripture changed as well. Now, I'm not going to use the whole afternoon to explain this to you. So don't fear or freak out because this is a lot of deep stuff, but I'm just covering a very basic idea with you. There's essentially, when you boil it down, two ways to really look at Scripture. There's two worldviews. There's a materialist worldview and a spiritual worldview or a theistic worldview. Obviously, if you're in a theistic worldview, you believe in at least a God. Amen? Yeah? We fit into that category. And the other category is a materialist view. That means they don't believe in anything is even possible being spiritual. So no miracles, no God. It's just raw material. Atoms and nuclei and electrons and energy. That's it. 
Well, the one piece of criticism that was really unpacked in that class, and as I've come to learn more throughout seminary and my own studies, is that historical criticism has grown. It's divided and branched into many different subcategories and specialties. Why am I wasting your wonderful Sabbath day looking at a boring slide? Well, because... Do you remember when we talked about um, orthopraxy and orthopathy? Remember, orthopathy is the reason or the heart of your relationship with Jesus? Yes? Yes. And you want a heart that's the appropriate size, right? We were talking in that the, the circles intersect with each other, and you need a balance. Well, what happens if your heart gets huge and you have a tiny head? <laughs> This would represent orthodoxy, your, your noggin. And if your heart was just, you experience life and you value love and relationships so much, it's the only thing that you have. Keep going. Now, I was going to put balloons on the feet, um, but it's really hard to blow up three balloons with one tube. So, don't worry. <clears throat> oh my gosh. Stop, stop. It might pop. So this would... Uh, have you ever known uh, yourself to have this experience or known somebody in your life that is an amazing friend? There's nothing wrong with them, but they have an over-hyper imbalance of a relationship experience with God. They don't know much, and they don't do much. They're just great people. They're not bad people. But we learn that sometimes you might not have much of a heart. Maybe you have all your knowledge. Are you ready? I'm going to squeeze it. This worked last night. Oh, don't, don't bump, don't bump. Don't grab me. Oh, come on, come on. All right, let it go. Let it go more. Oh, man. More. He's laughing. <laughs> more. Uh, it worked so well last night. Isn't that the way to, okay. No. Alright, just release it. Alright, now I'll pinch his heart off. Go. <laughs> now, you want a head or your brain and your, your uh, knowledge of orthodoxy to be appropriate, right? That sound? No, a little bit bigger. That's okay, right? But what if all you had was knowledge of God? What would that look like? Keeps growing and growing. And you have a little sick heart. And you don't do much with your knowledge. You kind of stick out in life, don't you? And what do people like to do <laughs> around you if you have a big head? They like to pop it, don't they? <laughs> yep. Should I pop it? No. Yes? You had the loudest voice. I'll do it for you. You ready? All right. It might be really good rubber. <laughs> ah, so much for knowledge, right? <laughs> we want an experience with God that is of balance. You want knowledge. You want to know what he says. Amen? What he says is important. You want a life with a decent heart. Right? You want to do the things for the right reasons. And you want a life that have hands and feet that actually do something with your heart and with your head. And the best person that ever lived that did this was Jesus. He showed you how to do it. Now, is it very easy to do? If it was very easy, we wouldn't be preaching. I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> Last March, um, a colleague of Dennis and I in this conference was, re was relieved of duty. Uh, the Hollywood pastor in our conference, uh, Ryan Bell, was asked to step down as minister of his church. Um, 
I don't want to use this time to, to make fun of him or bash him or demean him in any way. But he's an illustration of what we're talking about today. I believe that wholeheartedly and completely. What you believe, Jesus says, what you believe about the Bible does matter. Absolutely it does. After Christmas, he decided to do a project. And the project consists simply of this, spending a year without God completely. No prayer, no Bible, no church, no friends, no God talk, no nothing. He wants to blog his experience of being a atheist, if you will. Um, when he announced this on his blog site and on Huffington Post, etc., he had two positions, uh, one at Fuller and another at I could be wrong. It might have been Claremont, or was it Claremont? Right. They, they promptly uh, released him as well, because what he effectively did was deny Jesus Christ. He says he doesn't believe in him anymore. He believes in the Jesus of Nazareth, but not Jesus Christ. So he was relieved of his duties at two other positions, and made more blogs about it, and I don't know if you've been following it or not, but a atheist community has gathered around him. So he was without a source of income, and the atheist community decided to do fundraisers, and in one day they raised $19,000 to support his endeavor to run away from God. Now people in my family and other colleagues are baffled. How could a man who served God 19 years faithfully do that. Some people say, oh, he's going through a midlife crisis. It's this, it's that, it's so forth. Um, I don't believe any particular crisis could make any minister do the things that he's specifically doing. I go back to that first semester at Cal State University Northridge, and I remember what was taught. What was taught was a worldview. What was taught was systems of looking at Scripture. Powerful systems. In fact, these systems are the most influential, not just outside of the church. Friends, they're the most powerful systems inside church, inside Christendom itself. I don't want to teach you these systems. I want to inform you of them. Does that make sense? We live in a world that teaches you that what you believe really doesn't matter. Everything's kind of relative. There's many paths, there's many journeys you can take to God. Is that, does that sound familiar with you? Have you heard these things before? I don't want to say amen, but I've heard of it. Or raise your hands. It's out there. It's real. Uh, some have noticed in some of uh, his dialogue about being upset that he was relieved of duty at universities and, and that he felt that he was wronged for being fired... Uh, people were baffled. How could you possibly be mad for being fired from a Christian university when you denied Christ? That's just not rational. Well, if you didn't know, it is rational. It's rational if you have a particular worldview and if you utilize certain theology. When you look at the Bible through a materialist lens, when you look at the Bible as not being spiritual or inspired word of God, you view it as a work of of just humans. It's a piece of, a piece of anthropological history. You could be an expert in history, right? And that's what I first was exposed to when I was 18 years old at Cal State Northridge. This man was a double expert, two PhDs in the Bible. He knew more about it than I probably do now. But what he thought the Bible was, his starting point determined everything about what he could teach. He didn't believe in God, period. He didn't believe, furthermore, that the world could possibly be made by anything, no matter how much time was taken. He didn't believe a, a God could become a man. He didn't believe that a death of a God could provide salvation for you or I. What he did like were the ideas of Jesus. He liked Jesus of Nazareth, the man. Go back. So this quest of his was started 
by a question posed to him by a fellow colleague in ministry, a pastor. And it goes something like this. She was asked by somebody in her congregation or a friend, what difference does God make in our lives? And she couldn't really answer. And Ryan was at a stage in his life that he, could, he was struggling to, to give an answer as well. Well, I asked our youth in our church, what difference does God make? And guess what? Would you be happy to know that they had answers? Yeah, good, and good answers. And here's kind of what they, they, they discussed. This is what your youth said about God or Jesus making a difference in your life. They talked about the context. God, Jesus, gives you a context for your life. He gives you reasons for life, reasons for living. He gives you a moral framework. He gives you a worldview. The other category of things is God gives you answers. God gives you answers when it comes to wisdom or direction for living. God is also personal. God can heal. God can teach. God can give you peace. He can give you vision. He can change hearts and minds. He can make a drunkard not drunk. He can make an abusive person a loving person. He can change anything and anyone if that's his will. Amen? But there was one thing that I noticed that our kids didn't say. It's the bottom one highlighted in super pink. He makes a difference in who he is. Let me follow that up. Oh no. Jesus is the truth. Today's text was uh, John 14, 6. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I know I've only got about five minutes left, so I'm going to shorten up my sermon a little bit and just get to the, the nugget that I want to touch today. When Jesus said that he's the truth, the way, and the life, he used some very specific language. How many of you know from your English class in high school what the article is? You remember that? I didn't get an A-plus in English, I'll confess. I probably left high school not remembering what that was. But there was somebody in the class today, in the youth class, I think it was Liz, right? She knew. She's like, it's the. Absolutely. The. When Jesus spoke the way, the truth, the life, he used the definite article, meaning it meant nothing else. When he said, I am the way, that meant I'm the way. There is no other types of ways. There's other kinds of ways. There's not a, a choice of ways you, you have to pick from. It's I'm the way. He says, I'm the truth. He never said that I'm one of the truths or I'm a truth. If he would have wanted to communicate that, guess what? He would have said it. He said, I'm the truth. And when he said, I'm the life, he didn't say I'm a kind of life. I'm a style of life. I'm an idea I'm an aspiration. He didn't do that. Jesus meant his words. He said, I am the life. Period. We live in a world that doesn't like those three statements from Jesus. The world hates to hear he's the way. It hates to hear that he's the life. It especially hates that he says that he is the truth. What does this mean to us? Hebrews 11.6 says something really important for every Christian and everybody in this world to believe and understand as well. I met a woman who, uh, when I was a Bible worker in Portland years back, she had a Ph.D. in Christianity, uh, I think it was Christian early history. And I met her knocking on doors, and she you know, was very kind. Hello, you must be a Bible worker. You're here to study with me. That's nice. I'll pray with you, but I really, I don't have God in my life anymore. Like, wow, that's pretty forward. But okay, sure. You know, we made nice and exchanged names. She says, you know, I should share with you why I don't have God in my life anymore intentionally. I asked for one thing, one thing only. I asked for strength, and he didn't give it to me. I said, wow, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, you you feel that his answer was no. She's like, I don't know what his answer was. He just didn't give me what I wanted. I'm sorry. To, I mean, I wish I had something to say. I, I don't have a direct line with God to give you an answer. 
Um, but you feel that it's better for you to, to stop asking him than to continue? She's like, I'm just tired of it. I wanted strength. My life stinks. I've lost this, this, and this. And I needed power to get through my life struggles, and he didn't give it to me. I said, I'm really heartbroken that that's your experience. I don't really know what to share with you or tell you, and I certainly don't have an answer. But I think you respect me enough to understand that I have an experience with Jesus, and my answers have been different maybe than yours. But from what I know about God is that maybe he's asking something from you. And she thought about it. She said, nah, I'm done with it. I'm done. And, well, okay. Can I, you know, always pray for you? Oh, sure, go ahead. Knock yourself out. Doesn't work. Oh, I felt so bad. And then I remembered that first semester in college. How easy is it for you to walk away from something that is the most powerful idea, presence in the, uni- in the whole existence? How could you walk away from a living God? You can walk away from a living God when you don't believe in a God. What you believe matters. Hebrews 11.6 says this, Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For whoever would draw near to God must do what? Believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. I remember what she said. I don't believe he wanted me to have strength. Now, call me a simpleton, but the scripture says there are are some things that you must never let go of when you pursue God. There's promises that he's given each and every one of us some amount of faith, and we're to use it even if it's hard, even if it's tiny. You know, but Jesus, I'm sure most of you remember when his ministry was here, he said, even if you've got the faith the size of a speck of dust, a mustard seed, you can move a mountain if you just use it. It's my gift anyways. If you exercise what I give you, <laughs> ah, the things that will happen. John 8, 58, Jesus said, to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham I was. And here's where I want to get at today. It's important who Jesus said he was. Jesus said that he was the great I am. He said that he is the truth, he is the way, he is the life. Before he died, he was asked if he was basically God. And he said, it's as how you say it. He didn't deny it. I'm God in flesh, I'm here. And that's something that theology, current modern theology, loves to pick apart. If these things are true, then what does it mean for modern theology? It's, it's devastating. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth. In Jeremiah 29, 13, here's a promise. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I hope that you'll have space in your prayer life for Ryan. And I know that he understands this. There's many people praying for him and love him and call him friend. But there's a lot of Ryans out there, and there's a lot of Ryans still in our church. A lot of people have an experience with Jesus in our church that is just kind of a head knowledge and know a lot. There's some people that, frankly, do a lot. And maybe there's some people that don't have a lot of experience doing stuff or what they know about Jesus is limited. Maybe they have great love and passion in life. There's a lot of us, in fact, most of us, don't have a balance of what Jesus shows we can have with him. Matthew 7, uh, 7 through 8 reads this. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, it will be open. Jesus asks you, 
to call him out on what he says. He makes great claims, and he gives you the freedom to call him on it. He says, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the life. If you want to find out, why don't you come after me and challenge me with a pure heart and conscience. If you really want to know <laughs> that if I'm God and I make a difference in anybody's life, try me. That's what he's calling every one of us to do. He never said it's easy. And he never said that at any point you might never get frustrated. It is frustrating. I confess. I wish I'm at a point in my relationship with Jesus where I don't get tired or frustrated or confused. But he didn't make those kind of promises. He made promises that if you seek with all your heart, you'll find him. Now, I wish that once I found him, he was a simple thing to understand. <laughs> but God is huge. He's a mystery. I like that, though. That means I can never get tired of seeking him. There's always going to be more to tell. There's always going to be more to discover about Jesus. Jesus always gets better. Romans 10, verse 3, and I'm going to read a few verses and then we're going to close because I've kept you all the way to 1230. It goes like this. Romans 10, 3. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law of righteousness to everyone who believes. Verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will be not put to shame. I like to remind myself of that last text at least once a week. If I confess that Jesus is Lord, King, Savior, Way, Truth, Life, he promises that I won't be put to shame. My ego, I shouldn't care about. I really shouldn't be considering whether what I say will make me look this way or that. Jesus promises that if you confess, <laughs> believe, and pursue me with everything you've got, you can have an answer if somebody says, what difference does it make if you have Jesus in your life? You don't have to have a head knowledge alone. You can have experience with God. You can have a real breathing relationship with Jesus. And oddly enough, I found that at Cal State Northridge. I don't, I don't know why, but that's where it happened for me. I have a suspicion, though. I have a suspicion that I had a lot of family praying for me. And I did. I had a mom. I had a dad. I had a grandma. I had a grandpa. I had uncles, I had aunts, all praying for me because they knew the life I was pursuing and why. What I want to ask of this church uh, in closing as we pray, um, after we have closing music, of course, is that I hope that you have a renewed zeal for who Jesus is. I hope that you are not ashamed to believe that he's the way, the truth, and the life and the only one, as a matter of fact. I hope that you believe that your prayers count. And I hope that you believe Jesus every moment is on the edge of his seat waiting for you to ask that he becomes real in somebody else's life. That's what he wants his church to do. If there's anything he wants you and I to do faithfully, pray for someone else to know Jesus, to experience Jesus. It happens when we ask. It happens when you believe. It happens when you believe Jesus is the living God. What you believe about Jesus does affect the difference he will make in your life and in other people's lives.
If you believe that he is God, if you believe that he was God incarnate, the Son of, Je the Son of God, Jesus Christ, think of all the powerful promises and things that he's waiting to do for you if you just exercise a little bit of what he's given you. That's hymn number 183, 183. I will sing of Jesus' love. I will sing of Jesus' love, sing of him who first loved me for he left bright worlds above and died on Calvary. I will sing of Jesus' love, sinless praise my heart shall give. He has died that I might live. I will sing his love to me. Oh, the depths of love divine, earth or heaven can never know how that sins as dark as mine can be made as white as snow. I can sing of Jesus' love and this praise my heart shall give. He has died that I might live. I will sing his love to me. Nothing good for him I've done. How could he such love bestow? Lord, I own my heart is one. Help me now my love to show. I will sing of Jesus' love. Endless praise my heart shall give. He has died that I Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son to be explicitly clear. He is the way, the truth, and the life, no exceptions. Lord, we also thank you for the faith that you've given each and every one of us. Our request, Lord, is twofold. Lord, we want to live not just the rest of this week, but I pray that the rest of our lives, that we never, ever, ever forget who you are. What you said about yourself makes a difference. And what we believe in what you said also makes a difference. So, Father, help our unbelief grow our faith. And second, may we always be faithful in prayer for those that we love and are around, but also, Lord, for those who we don't know and who don't know you. Help this church to be a praying church for everybody that we can influence. Lord, we have friends and family members who, who don't know you, Lord, I ask that you help each and every one of us to pursue a balanced life with you. May we have good orthodoxy. May we have the right heart. And may we have the right means to do it too. Help us to pursue life, Lord, that you make our hands the right size, our heart the right size, and also our heads. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.